Let us pray. Each fleeting moment is an opportunity for us to stand true and tall to who we are and to be with this world with integrity and truth. We pray that as each fleeting moment passes us by, we will have left that imprint upon it, an imprint that offers beauty, goodness, and truth to a world in need, so that at the end of our days, we may have left behind us a trail, a trail of beauty that others might walk upon. This we pray as those born into light yet ever seeking it. Amen. The uh, focus moment this morning, the opening prayer, if you would call it that, began, each line began with one of the words from that list that Richard read from. It was an opportunity for me to stretch myself. I initially thought I would stretch myself by using only those words, but that was too big of a stretch. So I went back and just used one at the beginning of each sentence. Mark Nichols posts a website that's on writing tips, and this is a list, and after the list of the beautiful and ugly words, there's comments posted from a number of people. He posted it back in February. One of them, a teacher, speaks about how she would tell her students to turn their notebooks upside down and backwards, and every time they heard a word that they liked, to write it down there, or a word that they didn't like, if just the sound of it or the idea of what it was about, to put it down there so that they would develop over the course of a year a list of words that meant something to them. And on days when she needed a creative writing project, she would just tell them to turn to the back of their books and pick one of those words out and write about it. And found that whenever that was the project that they were to undertake, whenever that was the assignment, there was never a moment's hesitation because each word had already been selected by the child because it had meaning for them, whether positive or negative. The words that we attach meaning to are the words that have a purpose in our lives. We use them in ways that touch the world differently. Now, I think Mark Nichols is really quite out of line when he uses the word crepuscular and says that's a beautiful one. I mean, the idea of dim or twilight is somewhat lovely, but crepuscular really belongs in the list with other words like cacophony, cataclysm, chafe, rancid, repugnant, shriek, and shrill. Those are the words that Nichols has in his ugly list, words that I don't need to go much into anymore. But our words, uh, the words that we use, the words that we choose, uh, say a lot about us and how we use them. Dean Koontz is a fiction writer that Scott reads often, and sometimes he'll read a book aloud to me, or I'll borrow one of his. And Dean Koontz has a list like that, because he'd use crepuscular uh, to speak about the evening, or he uses big words that send me to the dictionary to find out what they are. And I'm always intrigued with where he would have come across a word like that and how he managed to use it in what might otherwise be a mundane and simple sentence. Uh, They bring uh, beauty and light and and energy to what we're trying to say. There are words in every different language, though, that reflect sort of that culture, reflect those people. We come up with a whole lot of words uh, for one particular thing as we understand and see the variations in it. Uh, The Inuit, it's often said, have something like 30 words for snow, and we have just snow. We have, however, about 30 words that you could put to pants. Uh, Corduroys, jeggings, leggings, uh, all those different things that go on. There's a whole list of them, sweethearts and painters and blah, blah, blah. It sort of gives you an idea of what's important to which particular culture, which words they uh, define in so many different ways and and which words they have to have a whole pile for to define. Uh, Some languages are very dense in that a single word has a number of different meanings and others are lighter and fuller with more words to explain different things. The words that we have used that are beautiful words uh, that come to meaning for us sometimes hold us through the whole of our lives. And I want to talk today about some of those words that have been common words in church, common words in the Christian community, words like salvation and resurrection and revelation, 
words that are deeply powerful for those who have been brought up in the Christian faith because there are words that ground us and tell an entire story with just a few, few uh, syllables, a few letters put together in a certain way. They give us a sense of who we are in the community of the world, identifying us much as a language would do. Marcus Borg, whose book has just been published, Speaking Christian, speaks about the whole process of using and losing Christian words. Uh, Marcus and I worked together at a workshop in the Maritimes in June and came at this from two different points of view. I saying that the words needed to be left alone if they've taken on meanings that uh, aren't uncovered or aren't generally understood in the language. And he saying that we need to keep them because without those words we aren't distinctive as Christians. He raises that issue in the opening of his book, speaking about how holding on to Christian language is for him a personal thing, being steeped as he is in the Episcopalian tradition and using words as part of the liturgy to connect him to all his forebears in the faith and his family and his own understanding of the world tied together with those letters, with those words that come to mean so much in that context. And also because he believes that if we lose that language, if we lose what is peculiar about it, what is different and distinct about it, that we lose our ability to speak together as people distinct and separate, something different from others. He says, you know, what if it were French? What if we stopped speaking French? People who were French stopped speaking French. Would they lose their identity? And of course we know that that's a huge political issue uh, that erupted in Quebec many years ago and has led to language laws there that privilege that language in order to keep it. In the mid-19th century, indeed in Europe, uh, Jews were recognizing that their distinctiveness had been lost, a lot of it, with their language. And so Hebrew was lifted and modern Hebrew was created at that point in time to establish, to reestablish that distinctiveness. And is now a language, one of the official languages of Israel and spoken by almost the almost 8 million people who live there. But I would question whether it's important that we see ourselves as distinct from the culture or whether our language should be something that doesn't separate us in the ways that Marcus believes it's important for us to do. But before we go there, I want to speak about some of the particular words. When I worked in the Northwest Territories, I lived there for six years uh, when I was younger, and there were several languages up there, uh, Dene and Slavi and Nuktitut and Inuvialuit, all of which we broadcast in at the CBC where I was working. And each spoke to a different community and told them, gave them information about the weather and about what it was like out on the land and passed news on about relatives over the CBC airwaves so people would feel connected and comfortable. And that's the kind of community that I think Marcus is talking about, that we can walk into a space and identify with everyone there because we hear those words and we're comforted by them. Except, of course, when we aren't. And so I raise some of those words that the job of reclaiming is very, very difficult. Words like salvation. One of the reasons that reclaiming a word like salvation is so difficult, or a word like God, or a word like sin, is that the dictionaries are against us. The dictionaries put out a definition not of what the word should mean based on scholarly appreciation of its history and its context and what it has come to mean most recently. The dictionary prints only that last one, what it has come to mean most recently. And so salvation, if you look to the dictionary, it will tell you about a Christian connotation of the word, what it means in a, in a typically traditional Christian understanding. The idea that we are saved uh, from our sin and that we are saved in the church, uh, we are, it is told we are saved by the one who was born into this world to save us. That concept of Christianity, uh, Marcus very quickly and very easily uh, ex explains and shows with scriptural detail and with historical reflection on the context that the, that word never meant that that it never meant that we were saved through the death of Jesus on the cross and that we would attain an eternal life of bliss and promise if we only believed in that. 
Marcus is a brilliant scholar and he goes back and he shows all the different places that salvation is used in, in the scriptures, Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures and ties, out a, ties together an understanding of its, its meaning for our past, for our present, for our future. That it's an ongoing reconciliation, an ongoing recognition of where we stand in our life and of what, is, uh, what we are in relationship with and making that right. That salvation is that bit of work in which we are always engaged and that as Christians we are called to that work. It's a beautiful interpretation of the word salvation. It gives us a challenge each and every morning as we rise to do that work of salvation, that work of knitting ourselves positively into the world, of seeing in each person that we meet the opportunity for us to be better in our reaction to them that salvation that happens over the course of a lifetime. And words like sin and guilt and forgiveness that lifted out of the the understanding that's traditional and typical in our culture can have very different connotations in our personal lives when we look at them and see what it means. The United Church's Song of Faith speaks of sin in a very different way. It talks about our uh, complacency and not connecting, and we are called through that to be engaged fully in life. It's not what I think normally, though, when I hear the word sin. And so Marcus, though he has a very powerful, personal, and very uh, appropriate and understandable reasons for holding on to that language, uh, yet I believe ties it, ties us to understandings that are just too powerful out there in the world. When we are church doing the best that we can do, I believe that we are a community that opens itself to those who walk in our doors. That opens itself especially to those who fall in our doors. Who because of what's going on in their lives, because of the circumstances that they're experiencing in that particular day, or that have been draining them of their energy, of their life focus, of their purpose over the course of a number of weeks or months. And who, in the midst of that, or at the end of what seems to be an impossibly long period of suffering, manage to stumble in our doors. We are being a community of faith, offering them hope and courage and sustenance and peace when we use the words that they fall in the door with. We don't need a learning curve so that when I talk to someone who comes in the door about their salvation, meaning, what is it I can do for you today to bring you to a place of peace in the next day or even in the next moment? I don't, need to ha- I don't want to have to tell them that that's what I mean by that word in order to engage them, in order to shelter them from whatever it is in their life that's making it difficult to help them create a shelter for themselves. When someone stumbles in our door, we are a community of faith when we offer them a place to be who they are, to sit in a space that offers love, to be welcomed into a space that will embrace them with honesty and with truth. When someone happens to stumble through our doors, no matter what is going on in their lives, I want to be able to talk to them, to be able to speak with them without putting a a wall between us of words that they don't understand and that I, if I said them, didn't mean. So our work as a community of faith is great. But it's not the work of reclaiming those words. Though if they're important in a private, personal, devotional life, go for it. I believe that our work is the work of community and creating a community that is open, permeable, a community that's responsive, and a community that works toward knitting all the things that those strong Christian words meant at one point in time. All of those things, the the strength, the encouragement, the, the connecting with life, the naming what is right and standing up for it, the salvation of a life moment by moment, that all those things 
be part of who we are and that we continue to offer them to the world. Many of you know that the home that uh, Scott and I sold and moved from, that the powder room was wallpapered with uh, sheaves from an old commentary. A commentary that uh, they're all Hebrew scripture uh, pieces that were reflected on, on those walls. But it was a commentary that came from the perspective that everything that had gone before in the Bible was all in preparation for the Christian unfolding in the world. And so written into those scriptures was, was a reflection that those prophecies meant Jesus and that that being said meant salvation and that this was the cross and that this was the line of David that would bring Jesus to birth. That commentary couldn't be on the shelves anymore. I was happy to have it on the walls, but I didn't want to have it in the shelves. In the new home that we have, we're going to wallpaper the walls in the power room with a book again, but this time just with a dictionary, with beautiful words from the dictionary that can lift us, that can hold us, that can edify us, that can challenge us so that those words and their beauty and the gift that they are might flow from us into the world. It's not about being different. It's about being accessible. It's about being with. It's about relationship. And so as you ponder the beautiful words uh, that were read today, and I have all the definitions up here if you didn't get some of them, um, find ways to knit them into your life. It was 10 years ago this particular Sunday that I asked the congregation, they all had five pieces of paper, and I'd asked them to write on those five pieces of paper, on each one of them, the most important things in their lives. What were they? What are the most important things? And they wrote those things on five pieces of paper. And then just randomly throughout the time that I was speaking, I'd say, okay, wrinkle one up. And then wrinkle another one up. And at the end, when I was finished speaking, they only had one piece of paper left. And I said to the congregation, whatever word is on that piece of paper, if it can be taken from you, if it can be destroyed, if it can die, if you can lose it, if it would fall apart, then wrinkle it up and throw it away because you can't hang on to it. The only things that we can hold on to are those things that we in this space hold on to. Those things in which we have faith, love, and compassion, and justice, and healing, and hope. And I could go around and hope that each one of you would have one of those words of beauty left on your piece of paper. The next week, two planes flew in to the World Trade Center. And those pieces of paper and what we had wrinkled up and what we had left became so important. It brought home to us how important those simple things are. So live your life with something on your pieces of paper with those words. Live with them in front of you. Guiding your step building your relationships, weaving your community, leaving a trail of blessing behind you wherever you go. And in this week, as we come up to that 10th anniversary of that tragic day, may you hold fast in your heart all those things you truly love. Let us pray. We live in a world that spins faster than any of us can really get our heads around. And at that speed, we know things unravel and shift and change and come undone. May we who have hands that would hold them together, would we who have hearts that would weave it back into a whole, may we who have minds that can comprehend incredible things, and see them as one and not as just bits and pieces together. May we work towards seeing this world as a whole, 
towards seeing all life on this planet as connected with us, not just people, but all life as connected with us. And as we do so, may we find ourselves hallowing the very earth upon which we walk. And so may we walk differently from this day forward. This we pray as light into light. Amen.